I'm Andrew Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we are talking to author Norman Miller, who is a man behind a riveting novel called Inside the Cold War. As James Patterson likes to say about certain books, the pages seem to turn themselves. That's how quickly you can get through this book because you'll be enjoying it that much. Norm, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Now, this is a novel, but it is based in fact in history, no doubt. Tell me a little bit about the book. Well, the original book, I Spy, is about a real adventure that took place in Riga, Latvia. I was an Olympic bobsled coach. And uh, after six weeks in Riga, Latvia on a cultural exchange, the, we had a press conference to announce that the Soviet bobsled team would be coming to Lake Placid 1990 to celebrate the 80 Olympics. And at the end of the ceremony, the, a man stood up from Moscow and he made the statement, Mr. Miller, since 1940, when Russia occupied Latvia, the Latvian socialist state has never conducted business on its own without first seeking permission from Moscow. My question to you is this, did it bother you as an American to avoid Moscow and deal directly with the Latvian socialist state? <laughs> well, I was really shocked that he would answer, uh, ask that and suddenly we were in the middle of an international political scene. So I referred the question to the Minister of Sports sitting next to me, and he made the statement, I did not invite the Americans. The Latvian socialist state debated for six months on how to handle the in invitation, and they made the decision the time had come for Latvians to handle their own affairs and not Moscow. Hmm. Well, that was a huge statement for him to make. In the middle of the night, the KGB tried to pick me up for uh, making statements. Uh, I refused to go at night, said I would go early in the morning. In the early in the morning, the Latvians smuggled a professor from Syracuse University who was with me out of the country and hid us in a Communist Party hotel in Tallinn, Estonia. But unfortunately, the Minister of Sports was arrested two weeks later. He was executed for crimes against the Soviet government. Unbelievable, unbelievable. So these are some of the real life situations that have inspired you, no doubt. That, that is, and that was really the basis for the book and how it started. Gotcha. Now you have two books and you also have the other book which of course is Inside the Cold War. Tell me about Inside the Cold War. It seems to be a little autobiographical. The protagonist in the book is a uh, US Olympic bobsled coach as well, correct? Yes. There is <laughs> some unknown truths in that book also. The majority is fiction, but in reality, some of the technology that we went back and I was able to obtain from the Latvians was brought back and given to the US Navy. Mm -hmm. And we believe that the technology that the Russians were using in their bobsled runners was the ability to include an alloy composite with steel, which over rough surface of ice uh, at 100 miles an hour would increase the heat slightly, which would give them a slight advantage, maybe thousands of seconds, but races are won by thousands of seconds. And we are under the uh, impression that uh, that's what it was, and I provided that to the Navy. That's very, very interesting. Now, in your book, though, it has to do with the Navy and about expediting the, uh, the force, correct? Yes. Yes. Now, you were in the Air Force, correct? 33 years, yes. That's a, that's a, that's a tour of duty and then some, correct? <laughs> yes, it is. 
Tell me a little bit about your Air Force years and how it helped shape your work. Well, the majority of my Air Force years was spent in recruiting. And my last 10 years, I, I was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, but I lived at my home in Schenectady. I, I'm just outside Schenectady on 100 acres of land. Mm -hmm. And I commuted all over the United States and the world, uh, mostly by the week. And my wife will tell you I lived out of a suitcase with a credit card. Wow. But I managed a national pro recruiting program for physicians for the Air National Guard. Very, very interesting. Now, I really enjoyed your writing style. Is there somebody who has influenced you? I noticed the prose is, is short to the point. It's direct. And yet it all captures the feeling when you start out with uh, the man in the van going from Long Island to Greenwich and he's having a cold sweat, even though it's warm inside, you really capture the feeling of a person planting a bomb. Tell me a little bit about your writing process and if anybody influenced you at all. Well, my writing process, I would say was influenced by a friend of mine who at one time owned the local newspaper. We used to have lunch together once a week. And I used to confide in him many of the experiences that I had, uh, primarily because the mafia was involved with the Bobslit Federation. And he was kind enough to keep copies of all my information in the event something ever happened to me. Wow. But he was an expert on English, and he probably had the greatest influence on me other than my wife. My wife is an extremely good writer with English, although she doesn't write, but she's very good at editing. Gotcha, gotcha. And it seems like you sort of write the way you speak, you know, like you were telling a story to a friend. Uh, that's the impression that I got, kind of a little bit like Raymond Chandler. Well, my, my thoughts are when somebody picks up my books, I want them to feel like they are there. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the point I'm trying to make. Well, you've been very successful at that, that's for sure. Tell me a little bit about your career as a U.S. Olympic bobsled coach. It's kind of an unusual sport. Um, I guess your roots up in upstate New York kind of uh, led you to it. How did this whole thing come about? Well, I grew up about 30 miles from Lake Placid. So my roots are really in the North Country. And a friend of mine was racing bobsleds. And he you know, recruited me to go into it. And so I raced for several years. And then... They wanted me to uh, coach the Olympic team. And I spoke to my supervisors in the Air Force and they thought it was a great idea for the publicity that we would get. And that's how it took off. That's amazing. So you were simultaneously in the Air Force while coaching a US Olympic team. Yes, I was. How many Olympics did you wind up going to during your tenure? I, I ended up, uh, in as an athlete in the 1980 uh, bobsled trials, and then I coached the 1988 Olympic Games. But uh, to accomplish that, the year before, I spent eight weeks in Europe with the, you know, the athletes to create a team, and then I spent six weeks at the Olympics. And I really felt that uh, I should go back to work. <laughs> felt like a vacation. Yes, it was. Amazing. Now, I remember the 1980 Lake Placid Olympics very, very clearly. I was a senior in high school, and it was a dream to travel up to upstate New York to go see the Olympics. I did not make it, but uh, it must have been a wonderful time. It's kind of a uh, more simple time, a more nostalgic time than it is today. I mean, I think everything's so high tech today. I don't know if a part-time coach from the Air Force would wind up 
coaching the U.S. Olympic bobsled team or even participating in the trials, but that was your story. Tell me what it was like representing the United States in 1980 in Lake Placid. Well, it was, it was a, a great experience, but as an athlete, you really don't have time to enjoy it. Athletes, and, and I assume all sports are the same, you're, you're conditioning all the time, you're exercising, you're, you're spending a lot of time debating on what to eat, what not to eat, and then you're working on equipment. Equipment takes up an awful lot of an athlete's time. Amazing. Now, when's the last time you actually went bobsledding? I, I think the last time I rode on a sled was actually in the Soviet Union. What year would you say that was? That was in uh, 1989. Okay. Okay. When I went over to the Soviet Union on the cultural exchange, they wanted me to ride with the Olympic driver, Yanis Kapoor, for a publicity ride. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, Russia, which after 1980 seemed to have settled down, there was the breakup of the Soviet Union and so forth, the end of the Cold War. And here we are whatever, 42 years later, and uh, Russia is very much a dominant world presence once again, uh, apparently massacring people in Ukraine. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts as, you know, a member of the military and as an author on what's happening over there right now and its global impact. I, I'm not surprised at all when the professor from Syracuse and I were in Riga, Latvia uh, on our cultural exchange, the Russian army was on every street corner, uh, soldiers with weapons. They were arresting and executing civilians then in, in Latvia. So I can understand what the Ukrainians were going through prior to during during the buildup. And when I was over there, I, I I don't know why, but this elderly gentleman wanted to meet me. And he was a former concert pianist. And one of the Russian czars wanted him to perform for him. And he refused to do so. And they crushed all his fingers. So he couldn't even write, let alone uh, play the piano. And I, I had a nice visit with him. And then he took me for a visit to the cemetery, which was located next to his son's property. He couldn't own property. He was considered a parasite. And the graves from 1940 were still dug up. And they, they, he said that they came in, they dug up all the graves, took all the jewelry out, left mounds of dirt, caskets exposed. When I was there in 89, trees were growing out of these hills of dirt. It said how people in other parts of the world live. And unfortunately, many people in this country don't understand what it's like to come under the rule of Russians or Soviets or socialists. We're getting a little taste of that now with some of the images that we see in Ukraine. Yes. What do you think uh, Putin's end game is? I, I think he's obsessed with rebuilding the Soviet Union. And I think once he finishes with Ukraine, if he's successful, he will move on to the, the Baltic states. And that would be very sad. When you visit some of these former states, like I did in, in uh, not Ukraine, but in the Baltics, there's so many beautiful, beautiful buildings. And if you looked at the cover of my first book, Ice Spy, that scene is the scene in the, in the Lithuania 
when it was built in the 1200s. Those buildings are still being used every day. Right. And now in Ukraine, those beautiful buildings have been turned into rubble. Uh, the country right. is decimated for years and years to come. Let's turn back yes. to your books a little bit more. Tell me as a, a prospective reader, what your book is all about. Let's first talk about Ice Spy and then we'll talk about um, Inside the Cold War. Ice Spy, let's give a synopsis to the viewers about that. Ice Spy is almost all true. That was basically what took place. You know, we changed the names of everybody and uh, but the locations and the events all took place. And this was just before the breakup of the Soviet Union. But what was interesting with I Spy is when I was at the 1980 Olympics, the Russian Soviet coach sat right next to me and he could not speak with me because he had a guard standing over him. And then one morning, I went to get an extra cup of coffee in the in the in the, in the Olympic re, uh, restaurant, and this very tall Soviet woman in front of me turned and said in English, "Good morning," and I was shocked that she would speak to me. So I said, "Good morning." And then I asked her what her position was with the bobsled team, and, and she said, "Well, I'm an interpreter." So I invited her to join the professor and I, and she said, I can't, I'm working. So I, I said goodbye to her and went back to my table. And moments later, she came over and she said, the man I'm working with would like you to join us. So the professor and I went over and joined him and he was the minister of sports for the Soviet Union. But what was interesting on that initial meeting he said to us, I am half Latvian and half Russian. And the professor and I didn't quite understand why he would make a point of that. So in the, after breakfast, we, uh, we agreed to meet the next morning before breakfast so we could have a longer visit. And then after practice in the afternoon, the professor and I went to the library in Calgary and looked up to see what was going on with Soviet politics. And the Baltic states had filed to be, to be separated from the Soviet Union. And so then we understood the point of him saying he was Latvian. So during the course of the visit the next morning, he made it very clear that the team was made up of Latvian athletes, but they were forced to have one Russian. <laughs> on the team. And so I took a lot of photographs of the, their people and enlarged them and sent copies to the coach and to the Minister of Sports after the Olympics and suggested that perhaps we have uh, a cultural exchange. And my concern was if Latvia separated from the Soviet Union, they had the best athletes, but they also had the best technology. And I thought perhaps once they lost the Russian funding, they would want to give it to the U.S. And so eventually we got over there and that's what happened. Amazing. Amazing. And that is the basis for the story, I Spy. Yes. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about Inside the Cold War. This is more of a novel. Um, but uh, based on fact, no doubt. And like I said, somewhat semi-autobiographical. Tell the viewers at home what this book is all about. Yes, well, there was a man who actually had designed the Soviet sled that the Russians were now working on. And that sled was being built in an airplane factory. And so I managed to get in <laughs> to the airplane factory at three o'clock in the morning, take photographs. And with it, I got some documents that I was able to smuggle out of the country. And 
but he actually had the concept. And once I came home, I discussed it with a very good friend of mine who at the time uh, was a PhD, a metallurgist, mechanical engineer with GE Research and Development. And he believed that they had developed the alloy composite. So later I was able to go back to the Soviet Union and we were able to um, get the sled smuggled out and it was taken to Helsinki, Finland, flown on the mail plane. I met the plane in Newark, New Jersey, took the bobsled with the runners down to the David Taylor Research Lab, which is the US Navy R&D. And they examined the sled. They gave me the sled back, but they kept the runners. So my friend from GE R&D, he's convinced that the, this man had developed a way to include an alloy composite with steel, which would be extremely valuable for naval ships. Gotcha. Interesting. And that's the premise of Inside the Cold War. Fascinating. Yes. Tell me about your writing process. When do you write? Do you write in the morning? Do you write at night? Um, do you write for hours on end? Or are you disciplined? You only write for a couple of hours a day. Tell me about that process. I, I write in the morning and I only write for a couple hours at a time. There's been a few times when I've written longer. It depends on how the words flow. Mm -hmm. Generally, I can go for about two hours. Then I take a break. I, I live on 100 acres of land and I love to get on my tractor and mow the fields. And when I'm doing that, my mind will roam. And that's how I come up with new ideas or how if I get a block, that's how I can work my way out of it. And then I think about it the rest of the day. And then in the next morning, I tend to write again. I write probably five or six days a week. Are you working on another book right now? I am. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the, the next book is based on real experience. It's um, intrigued by corruption. And it includes a lot of stuff from the first two books about the mafia taking over the U.S. Bobsled Federation. The concept, which I'm a firm believer, some of these people that did that were using their Olympic credentials to carry cash across foreign borders to Swiss banks. If you have a diplomatic visa as an Olympic coach or manager, you get a diplomatic visa and they don't inspect your luggage. And so that's what the story is there. Okay, it's a useful tool for the mafia, no doubt. It's almost hard to fathom that the mafia would have influence on the U.S. bobsled team. Why would organized crime have a role in this? And uh, do you think it's still going on? I don't think it's going on. The way it got involved is somebody involved with connections to the mafia, uh, who worked for the mafia, he, he arranged to bring a bus of 90 people up to Lake Placid for the annual meeting. And each person had two proxies. So when the vote came, there was only 80 bobsled members. They took control of the bobsled association. And then uh, they, put in four people on the, out of 12 on the board in the following year, four more. So they had total control of the Bobsled Federation. They controlled the money and they controlled the trips. So they uh, did it for the money. They did it for the access, like you said, to uh, bypass security at times, I'm sure as well. I, I am convinced and so were many other people that was the reason. But unfortunately, you have many, many athletes that pour their hearts out. They work extremely hard. 
and they don't have a lot of sponsors. And when their money is used for these people to take trips to Europe, yeah, I thought, well, at least pay your own way, but they, they didn't do it. Amazing, amazing. You know, you mentioned 100 acres. That is quite a piece of property to take care of. I'm sure that takes up a lot of your energy and a lot of your time. Tell me what it's like living on 100 acres, being removed by 100 acres from your nearest neighbor, I'm sure. And uh, that's quite an, an adventure in and of itself. Well, I, I, I'm very fortunate. My wife and I uh, had a chance to buy the property to settle an estate. And it hadn't, the house had not been lived in in over 30 years. So we spent almost a year to restore the old farmhouse, which was built in 1802, I believe was the date. And so we, we raised four children here. It was perfect. We're nine miles from the heart of Schenectady. Mm -hmm. And way out in the country, so our children were able to play in, in the woods and uh, in the fields and do all sorts of things that are good for children rather than on a city street. So we've enjoyed it. Absolutely. We've been here since 1970. Absolutely. I'm sure it's beautiful. Um, I recently, during the pandemic, moved to a farm myself, which is 10 acres, but uh, yours is 10 times that size. The 10 acres alone keep me busy. So I really admire the fact that you can do that. Let's talk about your books again. If you were to cast these as a movie and they have a lot of action, I could see them being turned into films. Tell me who you think would play the key roles if you were a casting director and were casting certain actors in certain parts. I, I, really, <laughs> I really couldn't tell you. There, there were be something of old like Clint Eastwood would be would be an action person that would pay, play into it but I don't know the modern movie people that would be able to do it but they're certainly full of action absolutely and that's what I love about your work it's very very visual you really get an idea of what that scene is like when you're reading about it Yes, I visualize what people can see, and I think about what I did see. And it, it's interesting, for example, I mentioned the cover of the of Vice Spy is the street in the Tallinn, Estonia. And uh, we had many, many scenes like that that we were able to produce. Wonderful, wonderful. Where do you see, so you've been a U.S. bobsled coach, you've worked in the uh, U.S. Air Force or served in the U.S. Air Force for 33 years, you're a published author, what else is on that bucket list of things you want to do? Well, one of the things that I had always wanted to do was play a trumpet. And when I retired from the Air Force, I retired at 60 and at age 66, I began taking trumpet lessons. Wow. And I play every morning for an hour. I play in a small orchestra in the capital region. And I find this to be extremely relaxing. I get up very early and play for an hour, then eat my breakfast and then write. That's amazing. So you are become very art influenced in your later years. Um, and I'm sure it's no small task playing that trumpet. It takes a lot of wind to do that, right? A lot of energy. It does. And I will add, every Wednesday, I play taps for all the military services at the Saratoga National Cemetery. And I find that to be extremely rewarding. I'm sure. I'm sure. And um, how far is that from your home? That's in, in Saratoga, New York? Yes, that's 50 miles one way. I was going to say, that's quite a, quite a trip to take back and forth each yes. week. But it's I'm, 100 miles round trip every, every Wednesday. Very nice. Very nice. It's another way you're serving your country. Yes. Well, Norman, I wish you a tremendous amount of luck and success with your books. 
I hope your books are turned into movies. The folks at home can learn more about you at your website, which I believe is normanmillerauthor.com, correct? That is correct, yes. All right. Well, Norm, thanks so much. You're an inspiration from your later years learning how to play the trumpet and obviously have mastered it to your writings, which are just riveting. Like I said, they remind me a little bit of Raymond Chandler's work, and he's one of my favorite authors. And uh, after this interview, I'm going to head back to my Kindle and continue reading. Your books are available on Amazon.com. They're also available in digital form on Kindle. So you have no excuse not to go out and get Norman Miller's wonderful works, which are Inside the Cold War and Iceman. Norm, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. And for you at home, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight, I'm Logan Crawford.